Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what funding it is giving to enable NHS boards to offer the best possible guidance and support to new mothers to encourage breastfeeding. Minister Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have invested more than £8.6 million from 2011 to date. This is provided directly to NHS boards for implementation of the maternal and infant nutrition framework, of which breastfeeding support is a key component. We have invested an additional 300,000 to assist NHS boards to achieve and maintain UNICEF baby-friendly accreditation. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for that answer. As a new gran, I've seen the superb support given by the Lanarkshire Breastfeeding Initiative to new parents to start and sustain breastfeeding, from the neonatal unit to ongoing advice and encouragement at home. However, in spite of the clear scientific evidence of the benefits from protection from disease to lifelong health benefits, there is a rapid drop-off of breastfeeding once at home. Will the Minister agree to meet with me and staff from the Breastfeeding Initiative to discuss how to further address this, including the consideration of the full implementation of the World Health Organization Code to address the aggressive advertising by formula manufacturers? And if she would consider that, I'd be very appreciative if she could also consider my colleague um, Elaine Smith, who's taken a great interest in this issue, joining us as well with constituents. Minister. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I am perfectly happy to meet um, with both Claudia Beamish and Elaine Smith on this. I have met um, <clears throat> people already from uh, the Breastfeeding Initiative. Um, as the, the member knows, we are undertaking a strategic review of maternity and neonatal services, and I hope that breastfeeding and support for breastfeeding will play a, a key part um, in that. Um, rates um, of initial breastfeeding um, are increasing, uh, albeit slowly and too slow for my liking. Um, but um, in order to sustain breastfeeding, we need to look at what support uh, is required, and I'm happy to meet with the member. Jim Hume. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, what funding and support is the Scottish Government giving to NHS boards to support perinatal mental health in uh, new mothers? I'm not sure that's entirely relevant. Uh, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Austin. I thank the Minister for uh, agreeing to meet. I'll be happy to come to that meeting. The breast is best message seems to be well understood, but the rates remain low, as we've seen from the, the answers given. So what can the Scottish Government do, perhaps, to turn this on its head and inform parents of the health problems that are associated with formula feeding to ensure that they've got all the necessary facts which will help them to make a properly informed choice and that then could help society move to a situation where breastfeeding becomes the norm with formula there as a backup for the relatively small number of mothers who just simply can't breastfeed? Minister. I appreciate the work that uh, Elaine Smith uh, has done on this, and if there was an easy answer to all of this, I'm sure we would have found it by now. The benefits of breastfeeding um, are explained to uh, uh, um, pregnant mothers uh, at neonatal classes, um, but sometimes the societal barriers um, are greater um, than um, mothers seeing uh, the benefits. So there are loads of strands to this and we need to make sure that those looking after um, mothers, uh, midwives um, and neonatal um, classes are uh, people delivering neonatal classes have the best possible information and ways of taking this forward. Question two, Cara Hilton. To ask the Scottish Government whether all treatments approved for use by the Scottish Medicines Consortium are made available by the NHS. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Scottish Medicines Consortium provides advice to NHS Scotland about the value for patients of every newly licensed medicine. When SMC accepts a new medicine, NHS boards are expected to make it or an equivalent SMC accepted medicine available. NHS boards also have clinically led processes in place to look at how medicines should be used in treatment pathways based on the available evidence. Cara Holton. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer? In November 2013, the Scottish Medical Council approved enzalutamide without restriction for men with incurable prostate cancer who had had chemotherapy. Soon after, Prostate Cancer UK was receiving calls from men who were being denied the drug because their health board had placed a restriction of their own on its use after the drug apiraterone. 
Prostate Cancer UK said at the time that men with incurable prostate cancer should not be expected to fight battles with the NHS for Scottish Medical Council approved drugs. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with this sentiment and will she therefore agree to implement the Scottish Cancer Coalition's call for all Scottish Medical Council drug approvals to be made binding on all NHS boards to resolve this situation and many others like it? Should our Minister. Uh, can I thank uh, Cara Hilton for uh, her question? This is a, a very, very important question. The Scottish Government is aware of the concerns of patient groups in that they believe that the approach taken by the regional cancer networks is not consistent with the SMC advice. The SMC have advised health boards that their advice does not promote the use of enzalutamide uh, in this uh, setting. Uh, while the Scottish Government does appreciate the points made by the charities, it obviously wouldn't be appropriate for, for government to direct the regional cancer networks to change their approach where they consider this is evidence-based. However, I'm sure that the regional cancer networks will review their approach as and when new evidence becomes available. I will keep a, a very close eye on this and I'm very happy to keep uh, Cara Hilton uh, advised uh, if there's any developments on that front. Question three, Hansala Malik. Thank you very much and good morning, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support the treatment of people with hepatitis C in Glasgow. Good morning, Mr. Malik. Morning, what? Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government is recognised internationally as a world leader for our response to hepatitis C. As a result of our Hep C Action Plan, we have more than doubled the number of people starting treatment for Hep C in Scotland, from 400 a year in 2007 to 1,100 a year in 2013. Many of those people who have been treated and cured live in the Glasgow area. Scotland is also at the forefront of implementing new highly effective therapies for Hep C, which are now available. The first of these new antiviral treatments was approved for use by the Scottish Medicines Consortium in 2014 and is now available on the NHS in Scotland. And Salah Malik. Thank you, the Minister, for the resp response. Greater Glasgow and Clyde have around one-third of Scotland's hepatitis C-infected patients. Therefore, the massive cost of the new enterphron-free uh, drugs falls disproportionately on the health board. This means that people in Glasgow have to wait until their liver is becoming seriously damaged before they are el eligible for the new treatment. One of my constituents is now undergoing treatment in another part of Scotland because they have a lower level of liver damage requirement to access the new treatment. Will the minister please look into this issue and consider giving additional funds to Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board to ensure equal access to new Hep C treatment across Scotland? Minister. Um, if uh, the member would like to write me about, to me about that specific case, I'm, I'm entirely pleased to uh, look into it. Um, the around 28 million per year is provided uh, by the government to support the framework and that is um, additional funding uh, and it is um, we, we separately we provide NHS boards with additional funding uh, to support the rising costs of the new drugs and of course it is proportionate uh, to the number but I'm happy to take up the case of this member. Question number four, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the level of engagement undertaken by Network Rail with local constituents during the building of the Borders Railway. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, I'm delighted that we will soon see the benefit of this £294 million investment by the Scottish Government in the Borders Railway, but I am aware that Network Rail has carried out extensive positive engagement along the route with lineside neighbours. And as recently as last week, the Project Director for Borders Railway and the Route Delivery Director uh, Scotland for Network Rail personally surveyed residents of Westfield Bank and Harden Green. However, I am concerned there have been instances where Network Rail's communication hasn't consistently reached the high standards we'd expect whilst delivering a publicly funded key infrastructure project. Consequently, I've written to Mark Carn, Chief Executive of Network Rail, expressing my concerns about their stakeholder management, and I await his response. Colin Beattie. The Cabinet Secretary is, of course, aware of our prior correspondence on this issue. Will the Cabinet Secretary confirm what steps are being taken to enhance engagement between the constituents and Network Rail and to ensure that Network Rail are taking the necessary steps to minimise any adverse effects from the railway on local residents? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, I am aware of the issue, not least because of the efforts of the member to represent his constituents in this regard. Uh, he will know that Transport Scotland will now provide me with a weekly update on the issues at Harding Green and Westfield Bank. As I have mentioned, I have written to Mark Carn already, expressing disappointment at the level of stakeholder engagement. Uh, I have mentioned also the project director's personal involvement in surveying residents. Um, findings are being compiled and an action plan will be developed to address concerns. I know the specific concerns relate to barriers, which we have, I think, got an agreed way forward on, and also to some uh, tree planting, which, again, I expect we will have an agreed way forward on. But it's better that these things shouldn't happen, because this is going to be a tremendously successful project for the entire borders and for Scotland. And we want to make sure that all those who are affected by the construction of this uh, have the effects of that uh, ameliorated, wherever that's possible. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I can thank the Cabinet Secretary in the first instance for his site visit uh, at Heriot and at Fallow Hill, which has borne the brunt of the construction works and they're not having train stations. But I can also personally put on the record my thanks to Craig Bowman, Stuart Mackay and Carol Devenny of Network Rail, who have engaged with me on behalf of constituents. But would they, I think the Cabinet Secretary has already said, and I would agree with him, I hope he'll persist in ensuring that their engagement with the community improves, because it has taken some time to get that improvement in place. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the only thing I would add to that, uh, President Officer, is that uh, there, will be, there was a meeting on the 1st of June with Network Rail and Transport Scotland and stakeholders. There will be a further meeting on the 17th of June. And as the member says, it is as well that we can try and address these relatively minor issues in terms of the whole project, but which are very important issues to the residents who are affected. And if we can make sure that we can address them in the right way, then we can all look forward to a fantastic opening of the Borders Railway in September this year. Question number five, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what involvement it had in the BAE Systems announcement on their plans to continue work at both the Scotson and Govan Yards on the Clyde. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, BAE is a major player in the Scottish and UK defence industry, and I am pleased that the company has decided to invest in the future of Govan and Scotson shipyards. The Scottish Government maintains regular dialogue with BAE and with its forward plans. BEE still has ambitions to support export opportunities as well as progressing with MOD orders and Scottish Enterprise will continue to work closely with the company to offer support as they make this investment. Bill Kidd. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very positive reply. Would the Cabinet Secretary be willing, diary permitting, to accompany me on a visit to BEE Systems to discuss future prospects for jobs and contracts in the BAE Systems yards on the Clyde? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I would be very happy to do so. I last visited the facility at Scotson on the 11th of February for one of the ongoing updates that I have had with the company about the investment plans. Uh, there has, of course, been very close working with Scottish Enterprise on the um, different areas of support that are available to assist the company in its investment, and I would be very happy to. Uh, to work with Mr Kidd and to accompany him to a meeting to discuss that issue with BEE. Question number six in the name of Stuart McMillan has been withdrawn for understandable reasons. Question number seven, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what strategy it has in place to ensure that listed buildings are preserved. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, all owners of listed buildings have a general responsibility to maintain their property. Where owners fail to meet that responsibility, planning authorities have powers to intervene. This can include a local authority carrying out necessary works themselves and building the owner. Similar powers are retained by ministers. Last year, we saw the publication of Our Place in Time, Scotland's first ever strategy for the historic environment and one of the key priorities set out within the strategy is for those involved in the management of our historic environment to continue to apply effective and proportionate protection and regulation with controls and incentives and I'm confident that historic buildings will benefit as the strategy is delivered. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you and I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Uh, Broadford Works in Aberdeen has the largest cluster of at-risk A-listed buildings in the UK which are under threat because of fire raising and vandalism attacks. Does the government have any tools at its disposal to force the owner to develop the site, which he has planning permission for? And is it possible to charge the owner for the non-domestic rates that he is currently exempt from paying? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, Historic Scotland's uh, role in listed buildings uh, is as advisors to local authorities. Uh, we are in contact, and Historic Scotland is in contact with the Council's planning officials, whose role is to liaise with the building standards colleagues and, importantly, the owner of the site to agree what additional measures can be put in place. And I understand that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service also uh, confirmed that they've had a, a multi agency site meeting on the 20th of May uh, with representatives of Aberdeen City Council, and they will be presenting a range of options for consideration by the relevant planning committee in the council. The member is absolutely correct. Uh, one of the best ways to deal with vacant properties and risk to va vacant properties is to make use of vacant properties, but we have to make sure that we do that collectively with owners and in conjunction with the relevant planning authority, which is Aberdeen City Council. But I, I uh, respect his important interest uh, as a constituency member in this particular interest uh, issue, and uh, I'll assure him that we will continue to take a keen interest in the developments at uh, Broadford. Question number eight, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the measures in the Queen's speech will have on the ability to tackle poverty and inequality. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, the Welfare Benefits Bill in the Queen's speech includes initial details about additional cuts in the UK welfare budget. These include freezing working age benefits, tax credits and child benefit for two years, lowering the benefit cap to £23,000 and removing automatic entitlement to housing support for 18 to 21-year-olds. These three provisions alone will make it much more difficult for the Scottish Government to tackle poverty. However, they only account for a fraction of the £12 billion reduction in welfare spend that the UK Government has said it will introduce. The Scottish Government will continue to mitigate the worst aspects of welfare reform, but there is a genuine limit to what we can do in the face of such severe ongoing cuts. Claire Adamson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. In 2005, during his leadership contest for the Conservative Party, the Prime Minister highlighted the need for cab referrals for food parcels as an indictment of failed government. Given this, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that for David Cameron and his government to pursue further austerity, knowing that it will see many, many more families plunged into crisis and relying on food, food banks, is both disgraceful and hypocritical? Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Presiding Officer, I entirely agree with what the member says. The Trussell Trust, uh, which is the main agency that runs food banks in Scotland, reports that in 2014-15, more than eight times the number of people were helped than just two years ago, and the most common reasons for people using food banks are benefit changes and delays and low income. The increased reliance on food banks and the further £12 billion in welfare cuts that the Tories are proposing shows they cannot be trusted with their welfare system, and we need full powers over social security here in this parliament so that we can establish a more equal, fair and simple and humane system for Scotland. Question 9, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what improvements it has made to the A82. Minister Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government is committed to improving the A82 and has invested over £20 million recently on the Creenlarch Bypass, the Pulpit Rock and at Glengloy. The Pulpit Rock improvement enabled the road to open to two-way traffic for the first time in 30 years and a £2 million design commission to improve the 17-kilometre section of the A82 from Tarbot to Inverarnon is also well underway. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Minister for that answer and I'm sure that it will be pleased to hear that I've been contacted by constituents across the West Highlands and beyond who are delighted at the improvements at Pulpit Rock on Loch Lomond side, especially as he rightly says that this has been a long-standing impediment to traffic for many years and taken together with the Crane Larrick Bypass. Do you have a represents. question? So does the Minister agree with me that with full borrowing powers we could do much more in upgrading infrastructure across the Highlands and Islands and the rest of Scotland. Yeah. Minister. Yeah. Presiding officer, of course I am happy to be the bearer of good news and spreading joy across Scotland with infrastructure investment. The short answer to the question is, yes I do and yes we could. <laughs> Thank you. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery. 
His Excellency Mr Euripides Evriviades, the High Commissioner of the Republic of Cyprus. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Kezia.